Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three of the Xenos podcast. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Awesome. Today we have Mo with us, who goes more popular by his Instagram handle, Three Sciences for A Level. And he's going to be, well, we've got, we've got a lot of questions from you guys and his own followers on Instagram. And we're going to be going through those questions together while we're going live. You guys can pop some questions in as well when they're related to a discussion we're having, and we should try to take that into the discussion as well. So, without further ado, hi Mo, tell us a bit about how you started Three Science for A Level and then how it's grown to what it has today. Hello, Zubair. Thanks for the question. Um, so, how did I start? Right, it started from when I have when I made some A level notes from myself because. I was struggling quite a lot with A-levels. So as I was making notes, I, I just felt like I had to share these notes with someone because in case someday I'm going to finish A-levels and then when I don't get to use the notes anymore and don't get to share with anyone, it would be quite a waste. So that's why I started this Instagram account and then used it to share my notes with people. So tell us a bit more about like the way because obviously you have your own distinctive style to creating those notes if you guys haven't seen them already he's mo has basically been posting his kind of like mind maps but they have their own like look to it they have and he's somehow captured a whole topic worth in the syllabus just on a single sheet of paper which is quite impressive it's he's been able to like get all these concepts which are like which if we tried to write down in words it would take you know a long kind of take a long time. Um, and if he's using visualizations to help remind him of different aspects of the topic. And tell us a bit about how that whole thing works. Basically, I just use my textbooks or revision guides for as what do you call it, like a source for where I get the information from. So basically how I make the mind maps, I just put the title in the center and just put on the subheadings and put on diagrams and just copy stuff from the notebook, only the important stuff, and just make it in a way that people are going to understand and find it easy to read it. Yeah, and also add colors, yeah. <laughs> yeah, colors are always good. Actually, it was very similar to how I created the Z notes as well. I would prefer, One of the first things I would do is go to the syllabus get the cha chapter headings in and then get the kind of like the syllabus within this within each chapter they the syllabus is broken down into a couple of you know 2.1 2.2 i use those as reference points and these because obviously the examiners have thought about you know how to break that topic into bite-sized chunks it's a it's a good framework a reference point for us to use as also another kind of like similar thing to because I've heard a few questions about revision as well. And so building just because it connects well here, because the syllabus is broken down so well and has these kind of like, you know, those little subtopics divided for you. I actually use those as an, as a kind of like a checklist for myself. So some of you guys were asking me, you know, how, what's, how do I revise? How do I make sure that I get through the whole subject? And one way to do that is to use the whole syllabus as kind of like a checklist itself. So you can like, assign yourself to do a certain chapter but not only that you can go down and say okay these are the topics i want to focus on today and then you just make sure that each syllabus point is satisfied so when i create or when the team has been creating every set of notes they make sure that every syllabus point is achieved through what we've explained obviously we're not going to go into a lot of depth but we're trying to at least make sure that you can hear make sure you can understand what we're saying yeah, so if you can if you can use that as a as a kind of like a framework for yourself to check off, you know, I've done that syllabus point, that helps just remind you and keep you on track of what you're doing. So a good way to make notes, but as well as to revise from those notes. Yeah, basically just use a syllabus or you can use a textbook and just put down the relevant points that are easy to remember. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. So I'm gonna start going into the questions now. Tell us about how you deal with study stress. Because you've obviously been through, you've just finished your A2. So you've gone through the whole like IGs, AS, A2 bits of your life. How, how have you found, what are the, so some of the strategies you've used to deal with those?
yeah, it is definitely a huge load of stress. So basically what I do, I just do my hobbies in my free time, like playing the piano. Yeah, that's my favorite. Just don't spend too much time on doing revision. Just break it down like you do it for one hour and then you spend another hour doing something you like, play a game, something like that. And then you spend another hour advising. Yeah, just don't be too stressed out. Do something you like to do. But at the same time, just, you know, like be consistent with your revision. That sounds like a good way to stay motivated. I also do something similar for me. It's going out for a run or going for a swim or you know, some sort of physical activity or yeah, so these are, like, it's really important to maintain hobbies that you have. Even working for Zeno stuff, it's really useful for me because after a long day of studying, and this is at undergraduate level as well, I'm doing my, for example, I'm doing my exams for third year or second year, whatever. It's a crazy amount of stress. But what I find useful is then going back and speaking to people, speaking to you guys on servers, just because it just gives you another, it's like sometimes we're like kind of like, too laser focused with like that's our end goal, which is very important. But we we tend to forget about the important things in our life as well, like health and well being and all that sort of stuff. So make sure that you're trying to like build. Make sure that you're like you don't forget about those. And those things are more important than sometimes even studying. Lots of us try to like maximize our time studying, and we like ruin our sleeping patterns as well. And I personally would highly be against that because. Well, I'm I'm a morning person. I I need my eight or nine hours of sleep every day, maybe not nine, seven or eight hours, and that's how I feel best. So I I try to find myself trying to go to the same you know bedtime around eleven ish, twelve ish, get out, disconnect from everything, and try to be up early because that's that's how I feel good. Obviously, there are people there they're the night owls or the morning, so make sure you know what you are, like experiment, um, do it experiment before your revision time. But once you have worked it out, make sure that you're sleeping well, because I know, especially at university, there are some of these crazy guys who are on Red Bull or some sort of, I don't know, high energy drink and up for hours and hours of like more than 24, 48 hours. So I don't know how they do it. And I'm not sure if I would recommend that way. So sleep well, guys. I totally agree with sleeping like at the same pattern. So like I have a lot of friends who sleep at midnight and like they spend their night studying so hard cramming revision and in the end they didn't really do well in their mock exams so yeah i would say just um it's really the people who are actually cramming at the end of the day are kind of the people who haven't been consistently working through the year so another thing is just make sure that it's not like you don't bring all of your kind of like problems try to make sure that as you're going through the as you're going through the year and I, I, I guess some of you guys would be ending exams now. So especially if you're going to like your next year, if you're going to A-levels, if you're going into your A2s, make sure that as you go through the chapter or topic during the class, you're going to be doing homeworks, you're going to be doing topic tests or whatever your school the way does it. Try to make sure that you're fixing your doubts along the way. If you're going to keep to the end of the, you know, when you're getting, it'll be really difficult for you to capture and go through all those issues that you've had. So another question for you, it's similar to, well, we've talked about motivation, but is there anything else that keeps you motivated for, for just um, question eight, how to stay motivated on your studies or on your three, how do you, you know, like, what's your aim? If you want to get those three A's at A-level, what's, what's driving you? What's the passion behind it? Actually, um, my motivation might, may be a lot different from other people, but it's basically to go to my dream universe, which is Edinburgh. And to go there, I would need three A's. So um, every time I felt like stressed out about revision, I would just think about Edinburgh, Edinburgh. Like just to keep me motivated to study hard so I could go to the university. And also to make my parents proud and, and having a good future where I can do anything I want in life. Just be happy. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to stay motivated. So let's discuss kind of the jump between AS and A2. I have some thoughts on that, but first you go and tell me what, how did it feel for you? You're more recently acquainted with that rather than me. From AS to A2. Well, 
it's actually a lot better than from IG, CSE to AS. I mean, from AS to A2, it, it's obviously a lot of hard work, more hard work, more work. For chemistry, not so much. Physics, well, physics and biology is quite a lot, but that's that's from, that's only my opinion. It depends really on like how other people see it. But yeah, physics and biology, is, it's a really big job. Well, maybe it's because I love chemistry, so it's not really a big jump. So uh, I would agree with that. The, the jump from IG to AS is probably much bigger than from AS to A2. But that doesn't mean most of the A-level subjects actually build on the topics that you studied at A-levels. So make sure that your AS knowledge is like polished. You know, you need to have all those things at the back of your head before you go to A2. So that's one thing that can let people down because we think that, especially if we're doing AS and A2 exams separately, we're like, okay, yeah, we're done with the AS and then that's out of our head. Something like, uh, like all the sciences and definitely math, I know that math requires literally building right on top of what your AS knowledge is. Because if you, if you forget that, then you're, you're not gonna get the A2 stuff. Especially for organic chemistry, like you have to remember all the mechanisms and all the reactions from AS. And even my chemistry teacher told me, oh, you can never go into your A2 without, without your AS knowledge. But I think it actually applies for all subjects, mostly for chemistry. Yep, I think it does. So question, how do you manage your time and not use your phone? Especially in, like, because this is a good question for you, because you're obviously interacting with thousands of followers every day. You know, you're posting, you're interacting with your with your followers, you're, you, you're, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in your head and you have to use your phone for that. What, what are some, like, how do you like say that, okay, this is the time I'm going to use my social media account and make sure that everything's all good. And when do you say that, okay, I'm putting it away. I'm going to get to studying. I'm normally not the kind of person who is like really addicted to using my phone. So I don't really have any problems with that, but for anyone who has like, who feels like they need to play their phone and it disrupts, how do you call it? Like their schedule, perhaps just put your phone away in an, another room or just turn off your phone or turn it into an airplane mode. That would help a lot. Yeah, that's true. I myself felt quite like, I don't know, distracted by, by stuff that wasn't even relevant sometimes, you know, using social media for me was quite disconcerting. It was like, you know, a lot of things are going on, different people, and you, because you have friend groups in lots of different places, some people are studying, the others, especially at uni, some people are finished with exams in the first week, they have one exam, and the rest is coursework for them, and you're like, oh man, I want to be there. Um, they're on holiday, <laughs> like, when your exams are not even, haven't, haven't even begun. So, I, not, not just for those reasons, but a lot of, for many reasons, I decided that, you know, I'm just going to switch off social media for a while. And I've just found so much more time in my life that I haven't really gone back. I just spend my time reading instead. And it's just like, it's crazy. I didn't think I'd, I'd have that much time in my life. It's really, if, that's what I've done. I know also that even if, that doesn't mean that you're, you're disappearing from any like messaging system. So the, the problem is that basically what, we take a lot of time actually getting into study mode or revision mode. Our brain needs to kind of like change gears and be like, okay, now I'm like, I'm like all malleable and supple. I'm ready for information to be coming to me. I'm ready to memorize. I'm ready to understand a topic. And the thing is we get to that position and then our phones are on vibrate or on some sort of notification sound. And the, the thing, it's just so bad because we've that little, whether you want to read that message or not, it's just going to ruin your concentration completely. So I would really recommend that find a way to like make sure that at least when you're studying, find a way that either mute your notifications or put it, put your phone in the other room. I know I, I, I kind of started following a friend of mine. He, when we used to go to the library to study and what he would do, he'd take his phone, mute it, and he'd put it on one of the shelves in, on the opposite side of, the, of his desk in, in, in the middle of some books. And so it was embarrassing to actually go up and check your phone because you know you you're, you're sitting in a in a in a desk full of like maybe like twenty other students, and so you every time you want to check your phone you have to get off your desk, 
go around the whole table, pick your phone up and check your notifications. So that was like a really good thing for me because it just stopped me from checking my phone. Don't, don't make it and don't feel, don't do something too strict, especially if you are like, you know, you have to interact with people. Again, we, we spoke about hobbies. If, you know, the, the problem sometimes people go down the route of like, kind of like cutting too much stuff off and then they're like, it's it then they crash it's like you know anything like some dieting strategies and you end up cracking when you're like at some stage so try to do something that fits within your lifestyle one of the things that we um well i've done quite a bit of while working with the cambridge leadership college last year and so on was using the pomodoro technique and i use it a lot in my igs as well so that's basically yeah so that's like um most of you've heard of it but uh 25 minute kind of focused work time and a five minute break at the end of it. And it's, it just works amazingly. I found, and the thing is then you're able to, to, to really say that, oh, I've worked for four hours or six hours because sitting down on a desk for six hours is not the same as working for six hours. They're hugely different things. And the Pomodoro technique works really well with that. It is able to give you a focus. So as soon as you start, before you even start your palm, you can lay down your kind of like two or three targets that you have. Okay, I need to get through these three syllabus points and make sure I understand this topic. Boom. Start the clock, go for 25 minutes. During that time, no notifications, no, don't even move from your desk. You know, like I would even say like, don't even look up to, to take a sip of water. You know, it's completely 100% focused time. It's not that difficult. And once you, once you get that 25 minutes done, it, it, I, I, would, I like to think of it somehow as like, you know, when you're swimming and you, you take a deep breath and you didn't try to like do that 100 meters without or 50 meters without getting up. It's sort of like that. You're just like, you're, you're, you're almost like not breathing for a few minutes and you're just focused and you're going to get that thing done and get up. And then you're like, suddenly you feel like you've progressed so much in that little space of time. It just helps you split down your day and it helps you plan as well. So Pomodoro techniques, um, we can discuss more about that or put some links uh, after the AMA as well. So Mo, a question while we were discussing uh, your university stuff. What course are you planning to study at uni? Chemistry. Just chemistry and I'm doing a BSc. I mean, I'm going to do a BSc in chemistry and I might do a master's degree or I don't know, maybe a master's in something else. We'll see. Yeah, I think I was similar to you. I've, I chose my subject and I just stuck with it. I loved math and I went to study math. And I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do after that, but I know that uh, like that's the, that's the only reason why I chose that course myself. Yeah, because like, um, to be honest, I think that at the age of 18, it's, it's too young to, um, to know what we love to do. Because like, maybe in the future, you might change and love something else and do something else that's completely unrelated to your degree. But for now, just do something you love. That's a good, that's a good way of thinking of it. So let's talk about, I'm not exactly sure whether this question was during an exam or just revising, but how do you overcome difficulties and when you're getting to a question and you're just like kind of freeze and stare at that paper, how do you overcome that? What are some strategies that you have? So when the subject was so hard, you got stuck and just stared at the paper. Hmm. <laughs> um, this actually happened quite a lot to me. Like, when I just got stuck in a question, I just do another question, do other easy questions first, and just come back to it later. And when I come back to the hard question, I would just spend, like, actually spend some time just reading through it again and again and taking deep breaths. And yeah, it, it actually helps a lot. That's actually a good strategy. That's kind of my strategy as well. It's, it's kind of like, try to get the stuff that you do know done. It's like, a, kind of like a vortex. If you get to a bad question, you're just stuck on it. It drains all your energy and you're, 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 you're not only you're, you're kind of like, you sort of your knowledge starts going as well. And somehow the, the easier questions start getting harder as well. So as soon as you kind of like identify that, hey, and this is kind of for me, my exam strategy is like, hey, this isn't exactly something I memorized or I studied for, or I didn't expect the, exa the examiner or my module guy or my course to, to put this on. And 
I, I don't know this. So as soon as I like, I start to stop thinking and I just quickly focus on another question because if I don't go down that rabbit hole, it's, it saves me a lot of energy. I try to make sure that all the other questions that, are, that I have studied for are done. And then I come back and I'm like, nice and okay, like I've done maybe 60, 70, 80% of the paper well, and I sit down and like, okay, let's, let's just experiment and it's fine. Another thing that I do for my exams, slightly unconventional, but I, I try to like forget about the, the fact that it is an exam. I remember when I was going into my A-levels, uh, because some of us, so, so my, my closest friends were also my friends who were doing like some of the A-level and IG subjects earlier with me. And so we always used to, because of our candid numbers and stuff, we'd always sit together in our exam hall. That's how just because of the candid numbers were that way. Um, and that would mean we would be in the middle of all the other year, like the year above us. And it would just be like four or five of us. And the first thing that we would do, like me and my best friend, we'd sit down on, the, on our desk, take our shoes off, roll up our sleeves, um, you know, like just like smile a lot, laugh at each other, even in the exam hall, which is not correct. But like it just it just made me feel so comfortable. And I'd go into the exam thinking, you know, this is this is my worksheet or this is a past paper I'm doing in front of on my on my couch. And so. It was just that mindset shift and I'd suddenly be in a completely different zone. And it was, and I'll like, by the end of it, I remember um, some of my long exams, like the further math, further math exam, which was like three hours long. And there was no one in that exam hall. I would, I, like, there were just two of us and we had one examiner who was, who'd sat for us. Like it wasn't, it wasn't in a, the, the timing itself never matched with any other exams either. So it was like, a hall for like 500 kids with two of us in the middle of it and like it just you know I just like zoned out and like I just kept doing the paper I was like it just felt like I was messing around experimenting with different techniques and then I realized whoa I'm actually doing the real exam and that was at the end of it and I was like here take my exam paper I'm done because like it can be really scary when you see it as a real paper because from my experience um like this happened about a month ago I was doing my biology paper and you know like in my mind I was thinking like oh this is the real exam like I cannot mess this up what if I mess this up and perhaps lose lose one mark off an A and then I don't get to go to the university I want to go and and then like it can be it can it can felt like really really scary while doing the exam so yeah just just think of it as doing a, like a past paper and just basically chill it helps a lot. Question for you, Mo. What inspired you to make those, like, to make those such beautifully written and drawn diagrams and mind maps? What, what, what was the? Because you know, like a lot of us, are, um, I do it as well. I, I, I work on like scrap papers and like write down messy notes. What was it that? What motivated you to make sure that oh, this has to be like this perfect, aesthetically pleasing piece of art? And how long does it take for you to make one, approximately? I mean, like, as a child, I always loved drawing, was drawing, coloring, and, you know, all that art stuff. And um, so when, when I started, started making notes for IG, CSE, and AS, I just decided, like, oh, well, why don't I just try, like, you know, just use my art skills to make these notes just to see how it's going to go. And, yeah, it turns out to be really like I really liked it and yeah so it just basically combined about four hours but the way I do it I just do it like one one hour a day so yeah it's not really stressed out yeah but it also depends on the the topic I'm doing too like for for like homeostasis I took eight hours to do it so I spent like two hours a day, so four days to finish it. Wow. So, uh, like, I'm not sure if this fits for you. I, I'd imagine it would be, but actually creating those diagrams is, or for me, when I was writing the Xenos, those were actually the things that helped me study. So, like, actually, in, in fact, like, for my A-levels, I didn't particularly sit down and read my notes for a long time. Um, during the year, writing up the notes was the the task of studying for me i'd imagine that was the same for you so if you like 
when we say when Mo says four hours or eight hours, he doesn't just mean it took him four hours to draw that or decide which colors to use because that is part of the whole process. But the actual process is also getting that information in his head because as he was working out which piece of information to put on, which diagram would be most useful, how to label it, you know, all those things, all those decisions that he was taking was actually meaning he was putting something at the back of his head. He's like, and the good thing about the great thing about like using your your hands and like writing stuff out and especially visualizing stuff is because you're reinterpreting information. It's a completely different part of your brain that's interacting when you're interpreting information than when you're just reading. I like to say I like to think of it like active learning rather than passive learning. So reading is quite passive for me. It means it feels a bit like like when I'm reading my novels, you know, it's like I'm kind of like accepting information yeah there's stuff happening in my head i'm like imagining the scenes in that story fantasizing about certain things but the actual ability of reading is quite passive being active about everything so one of the things i did recommend a while back when i was writing how my how to study article was that even when you have a printed set of notes or even if you have most diagrams on in front of your like on your desk try to try, try to reinterpret it relabel stuff mess it up you know doesn't matter if you're not an artist like Mo, but like add stuff to it, change stuff around, recreate that with your own pens and pencils. And it seems quite futile to do that, but I have at the end of the day, I I didn't bring some stuff back. I'll when I have um some of my revision stuff from this year's exams, I'll show you. I've written out proofs at least 10, 15 times. And some of the last times I've written out those proofs. So for my exams um i need to memorize proofs and because it's math and it's rigorous it means that if i if i miss a single sentence out my whole proof gets wrong um if the if if it's a less than sign and not a less than or equal to sign it messes stuff up so obviously you need to like all all these little details you need to know from like inside out and the way i did it was i'd rewrite again and again and again and those motor skills and at the end of the day there was I would write so badly or so illegibly that I can't read the two lines above me just because my hand, I wasn't even writing at that point. I was just like scribbling. But that, those were the, these kind of like repetitive skills were putting stuff in my head. And not only were they, was I memorizing, because I'm not a big fan of like promoting pure memorization. I was actually learning stuff at the same time because every time you go through a very, very complicated proof, you're finally getting stuff how things connect together. And similar to, you know, stuff, topics in sciences or any A-level subject as well. As, as soon as you go through that topic again and again, those those key facts, those kind of abstract concepts start making more sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Because, like, even for my own notes, I, I printed out my own notes, right? And then even I scribble on my own notes. So, yeah. I would say it helps a lot. The day before my exam, I wrote out my own set of notes, which I have with me in the back of my like exercise books. But those, like, you have to remember that, like, after Mo created like hundred of billion, hundreds of like beautiful diagrams, he's he's done it again. So this is like it's part of the process. You you do these, you you take these steps over and over again, and suddenly those concepts get clearer and clearer each time. Yep, repetition trying to do it in a different way it works i think this is a good question for specifically for people studying the three sciences for a level talking about practicals how do you uh, manage to do them all on time what what were the things that you like what was your way of doing them that made sure that you were ready and done well practicals they're just mostly they're all the time they're arranged by my teachers so um like my teachers would arrange practicals for me and my friends to do it like like many times before doing the real practical and like like for chemistry my teacher arranged me to do practicals from since like december january just do it for like um once every two weeks just do it consistently and do it many many times just to get you know like um to to get used to the like 
like so like when when you do the real practical you know exactly what to do so basically just practice many times and learn from your mistakes i again it goes back to some of the things my my exam like strategies when i what i do in the actual exam as well i kind of try to forget that i'm in a time constrained environment i actually enjoyed my practicals very much i love the titrations i loved all that sort of stuff so i would just you know i just be enjoying it and again uh, we were lucky enough to have a very good chemistry teacher an okay physics teacher <laughs> but um that meant that not 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 the greatest but yeah we would um we we were given a lot of opportunities to practice and at the end of it it was like we'd done it so many times we'd been doing it for like week on week for about a term and so it was it was like those skills you really do need to practice as much as possible you know how to keep your hands when a titration is happening you know using a burette using this sort of things making sure you're putting enough i don't know i'm thinking about chemistry right now even the, the physics stuff i didn't do bio obviously but it somehow again practice will help you get those skills really really sharp and again the the pitfall is just thinking you're you're doing you're you're going too slow or you're you know as soon as you start creating those kind of negative kind of <laughs> images in your head that you're going to not finish on time it starts it starts actually creating an impact on what you're doing at the at that time as well try to get as much of it done as possible yeah practicals they normally let you do for like an hour and 30 minutes right i mean this is quite a lot of time so there's no need to be warning about not having enough time plus the time they said for you they they will know that you will have to like you know use the time to think through things so there's no point in panicking really so let's shift a bit towards university and what you've done to get to or like what you're doing to get into university because a lot of our listeners would be students who are you know understand they're thinking about where to go how to apply and stuff like that so tell us a bit about your experience with the uni admission process so you're going to the uk like that, that those were your main applications i just registered through ucas ucas is a website that helps us apply to the uk i chose to apply to edinburgh and they gave me a conditional offer of 3 a's so i just have to get 3 a's and i don't know if i will get it yet until results day which is on august and on results day if i get 3 a's then i'm going to edinburgh but if not then i'm going to in nottingham cuz it's an offer of a b b talking a bit more about the actual applications and like so writing up your personal statement that's a very important part of applying to the uk trying to capture as much of yourself in i don't know 4000 characters it's actually the hardest section to do a personal statement cuz you know you'll need to do it in 4000 characters and you will actually need a lot of help from your teachers in editing and try to make it look as good as possible cuz you'll be competing with how many like millions of people right yeah there are like um a couple thousand people per space at most universities these days well like i mean at for every position at a at a uni i know that um they're quite a, like depends on which university but like sometimes 100 or 1000 students are competing for that same same spot so it's quite a difficult one again re- remember at the end of the day mo's when mo's offer came it wasn't anything to do with his personal statement it was about his grades so especially with the uk you do need at the end of the day to get the grades as level grades are very important even though I might be scaring some of you guys I'm sorry but they are important you do need to it basically it reflects for them what sort of performance your A, your A levels would end up with you know because you can easily predict if you're getting A's and if you're getting high A's you know what does that mean and at the end of the day they need grades yeah and IGCSE so again IGs are important because they think they look at IGs and because it's a, it's 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 slightly easier obviously the, the ideas and concepts and the way you're examined it's much easier to get an a star in in an ig subject than an a in an as subject which obviously makes sense but they they can see with the way you perform in at ig how consistent you are and how hard working you are because to some extent i would say that 
ideas are basically if you work hard enough and you plan well enough, you should be easily able to get A's and A stars throughout your throughout your subjects. Yeah, it's actually very easy. Like you can spend like a few hours revising and get an A or A sub for A levels. It's a whole different. Level. Yeah, but that's it, it. Means that you have to be very consistent with your studying. And that's what they see. They just they, what they'll be able to see with your IG grades is like, okay, this guy actually was, you know, he was on top of his game from from age 14, 15, 16. So that's how it helps. So going on from uni admissions, there was a question a few minutes ago about taking a gap year after AS exams for studying uni admissions. Um, firstly, I want to ask you: Have you heard of that happening? Have you seen? or have friends who did that? Uh, no, actually, like, some of my friends, after they finish their AS, they just go on to Thai universities, but most of them just stay to finish their A2 and then go abroad. So I don't have any friends who do a gap year after AS or even A2, really. I'm not exactly sure that that is a good idea. I mean, a gap year between AS and A2, just because, as we explained before, the, the topics and concepts in AS directly relate to those in A2. So there is a clear, like, yeah, you, you need that progression. And it's not going to help if you take a year out, even if it's for uni admission. Honestly, you do have the time. You Like, lots of people feel, like, stressed out. And if you actually manage your time, last week we talked about extracurricular activities to do over the summer. And one of the things I did focus on was that try to get your uni admission stuff sorted out Think about, so and there was another question about SATs, especially if you're studying the A-levels as most of you are, or IGs, and are planning to go to the US or even universities around the world which require SATs. Well, it's difficult to justify a need to take a gap year just to study an SAT for an SAT exam or for applying to universities because people are doing it, right? And it's possible. It just means that you need to manage your time better. Use your summer to research about where you want to go, what you want to do, research about which what your university requires from you. And like we were speaking about earlier, the personal statement is a very, very important piece of document that you need to create. It takes a long time and start it over the summer. A piece of advice for the personal statement, what I did was I used, so there's an actual formula, right? There's a format of how a personal statement should look like. You introduce yourself, you talk about your early education, you talk about this, 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 this. I would recommend you having a look on online i think the student room has a lot of examples there is there are lots of examples of personal statements for that specific subject that you're applying to and even to some there's there's even examples of people applying to that university for that subject that you want to study as well so go online try to find those examples use those don't copy because you're going to get you're going to get caught out but that's not the point i'm giving you i'm giving you a kind of a, a way for you to see exactly how these things look like because experiences differ and you if you copy someone it's just not going to work with you but look at the examples look at the way they they formatted they and look at the people who've got accepted at the place you want to go and start working on personal statements over the summer it doesn't have to be your first even have you don't even need to come up with a full draft you can just put ideas down you can write a couple paragraphs and be go to your counselor or if you don't have a counselor then your friends and peers or family members and ask them for advice and say okay this is what i have right now that's actually what I did too. Just bullet points all the things special about you, like your hobbies or what makes you, what do you think they would make, like how, how do you say it? Like what things about you that they would want to choose you? So just have a think about it and just bullet points it. And when school opens, you can just easily do your personal statement. Well, it's not that easy actually, but it helps a lot. Couple of questions. We've kind of discussed a couple of questions that Furry asked us about tech teaching methods and how they're going to be implemented in education institutions. It's difficult. We tried some of those, like the palm technique, and there are ideas about sprint using concepts from agile, kind of how tech teams are developing and creating new pieces of software. And there are ways to take that idea and those like kind of high speed learning or they're, they're actually developing stuff, but those concepts apply to learning as well. And they should be linked to one of our earlier kind of talks I had with Tom about that. And he will, we've done a 
quite an in-depth thing about how we think education institutions should implement that. So we'll reference that for you. Um, so um, a question, um, did you go, and this is more about like school life, did you go through any kind of emotional challenges during school um, and how did you overcome them? I don't know if you want to answer that. Emotional challenge? Um, <laughs> okay, let me think about it. Mm. I think there are some emotional challenges, like when you make some friends and then you lose them. And well, but, but for me, it, do, it doesn't really affect my study much. Because they're like, like, I don't mess the two things up. But yeah, like, like when, when I go through something very emotional, I just have a talk with my friends and just my family. It, it's not really that difficult to over, you know, just just have someone who's supportive to, to talk to. Yep, family, friends, you know, always good people to talk to during challenging times. Yeah, I mean, like, there will always be emotional stuff going on, like, through your A-levels, like, with study and also personal. Yeah, stress does get quite high. There was one of the things I was, I was speaking earlier about was, I was speaking to some, like, kind of, like, an adult. I don't know, it was, like, a lot, loads of adults who were talking about how, like, school and education has changed since their times. And one of the things is that it's crazy the amount of stress that some of us are going through at such a young at such a young age. So we feel like our A levels are determining basically our life, um, and it's true because like the way the world is, is constructed right now, you know, you need to get those IGs, you need to get those AS and A2s, you need to get whether that whether it's that or the SATs or the IB, you need to sound like you've been dreaming and breathing and living that your whole life to get to that university and pursue that course. And it's directly, we've seen, um, there have been like researches, I'm not exactly sure where I can find some references for you guys, but the emotional stress and stress in general that students are dealing with at this, at such a young age, some of the most stressful jobs back in the, in the kind of the 20th century didn't, can't correlate to them. Like, and this is, these are adults and they're those, like the stress levels that some of the kids are facing is, is more than that. And it, it is a very tough time. Again, speaking to people is really helpful. Friends, family. I think for one of those reasons, our team has also constructed a mental health support channel in on the Discord community. Um, speak to us, speak to people who are going through the same things as you. Know that you're not alone. That's very important. Um, there are lots of people going through the same challenges, facing more or less emotional and physical strain on their on, on kind of because of the goals that they see for themselves. So that, yeah, keep an eye for that. So let's, yeah, I'm gonna kind of like go away from studying and all those sort of things now um, and talk to you a bit more about your work with social media. Tell us a bit more about how you got to like with those, like you started, you told us you started just because you wanted to share your resources out there. And then how did it become so famous. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I also saw that Cambridge, like Facebook groups and st stuff were also like reposting and talking about your, your work. How did I manage to gain fame on my Instagram account? So I did some research about how, how Instagrammers gain their fame and just looked into popular Instagram accounts. And just basically see like how they post stuff and what do they do to gain fame. And I mean, at the time, I didn't really expect this many people to know about my account, but I just basically did the things that the popular accounts did. So just use the hashtags, just do shout outs and just, you know, interact with a lot of people, post consistently and like actually post like really good stuff because that's what people want to see so it's kind of like you know like doing a business really just doing what people like making something people want to see from you and yeah like when people like it they will share it to pe other people their friends and that's how you grow really just doing something that 
many people need, like, you know, like <laughs> A-level notes because that's what most students really need for that exam. Yeah. And another thing, I guess this just came off from you because you were, you, this is also the way you're studying, but there was a, there's a high consistency in the quality and deliverance of your content. So that's definitely an important factor as well, because people weren't like, oh, one day Mo was posting something that he did, he spent hours creating, and then the other day he was copying someone's diagram online and putting something together. So it was like the consistency also matters, I think. And that's what, well, that's what attracted people and made sure that you were, you were recognized for what you were doing. So tell us a bit more about how do you target those audiences on social media? Like, how do you get to the A-level students? So it's mostly just shout out because the peop most of the people who follow me are just people around my age who are doing their A-levels. So when they give me shout outs, their friends know about it. And then their friends follow me and then they gave me shout outs. And that's how my account grows really. Basically, I just interact with those people and that's what makes my account grow. Just do it in a, like in a, you know, like business kind of way. <laughs> So I actually, we've been speaking for quite a while. I didn't even realize it's been, we said that we'd do a 45 minute session and it's almost 50 minutes, but um, yeah. But the questions are great. We enjoy talking and great to have Mo on. We, we've basically tried to cover as many of the questions and areas you guys asked, to, asked us to talk about. We will have another session next week. As always, we'll send out some feedback to make sure that the time works for you guys. And if there's anything we can do to improve we are also we've been so we've been uploading these recordings on YouTube. We've also just recently got onto Spotify and SoundCloud. So it's obviously it'll be easier for you guys to listen without like having some sort of YouTube video link or running or anything like that. Let us know what you guys think and we'll wrap it up for today. So thank you for joining us today, Mo, and thank you for all our live listeners. Um, it was great to be here. Bye guys.